that has arisen out of the Western study of Indian philosophy, as well as out of the tradition of Western philosophy in relation to the whole problem of illusion, is the question of what is called in the technical jargon of Western philosophy, subjective idealism. This is the theory that all reality is mental. And uh, we have to start by making a clear distinction between subjective idealism and solipsism. <coughs> solipsism is the doctrine that you are the only person who exists. And everybody else is your dream. And you can see there's a certain analogy between that and the Hindu idea that all this cosmos is the dream of the Godhead. But the difference here is that in, in, in the solipsistic doctrine, it is just you as you more or less know yourself from a conscious standpoint as a finite individual, and not much more than that, having this dream that all these other people exist. There's no way of really producing an argument against solipsism because you can always say to a solipsist, what evidence, if someone could produce it, would you regard as disproving your idea? <clears throat> That's a very disconcerting question to ask anybody, and I give it to you if ever you get involved in philosophical one-upmanship. Ask a Freudian, what evidence, if it could be brought forward, would you consider to disprove the Oedipus complex theory. You'll find he can't think of anything at all. Or ask a theologian, what evidence would you find conclusive as disproving the existence of God? And he can't think of any. Whereas <clears throat> other people, if they, you ask them that question, will suggest an experiment and say, all right, if this experiment is negative, uh, then we'll accept the evidence. And one of the classic experiments of this nature is the michelson molly experiment, which disproved the existence of the ether, as at any rate in the form that people have conceived ether. And it's been generally accepted. Somebody thought out what would happen if there were really ether. <coughs> so, this is always one of the problems of solipsism. And we're going to see it's one of the problems of subjective idealism. But the, the difference between solipsism and subjective idealism is contained in the famous double limerick. There was a young man who said, God, I find it exceedingly odd that a tree as a tree simply ceases to be when there's no one around in the quad. And the reply, young man, your astonishment's odd. I'm always around in the quad, so the tree as a tree never ceases to be, since observed by your faithfully God. <coughs> the great subjective idealists in the tradition of Western philosophy are, of course, Berkeley, and the, the bishop, and Bradley, A.S. Bradley. And uh, it's in some ways difficult to make out exactly what they were saying when they said that everything is in the mind because they could never say clearly what they meant by the mind. But if you will be a little naive for a moment and, un and seem at least to understand what you mean when you use the word mind, they will pitch the argument in the following way. You do not know anything except in your own mind. The whole existence of the external world is something known to you in your mind. The distance of other people and other objects from you is a distance that exists in the mind. You cannot possibly conceive any world existing unless it be an experience. Could there be an unexperienced world that would not be a world for anyone or anything, 
Therefore, it would not be at all, because being is always being for something. It is, in other words, relational. The sun is light for eyes. Eyes are organs of vision for a mind. If there are no eyes, the sun gives forth no light. If there are no nerve ends, it gives forth no heat. If there are no muscles, nothing is heavy. And if there are no soft skin, nothing is hard. Because it's only in relation to a certain softness that something hard can be said to be hard. Only in relation to a certain degree of measurement performed by the neurons that things can be said to be relatively hot or cold. Hot and cold are the impact of energies on a nervous system. Energies at all are recognized as energies by their impact on something. So the Zen poem says, The tree manifests the spiritual power of the wind. The water, the miraculous energy of the moon. So the tree is waving. And we wouldn't know there was any wind around, you see, unless there were a tree or something like it to wave in it. And in the same way as uh, the moon, when the water ripples, breaks up into a thousand fragments and shimmers all over the place, you see, we wouldn't know that the moon had this miraculous power to duplicate itself, to triplicate, quadruplicate, multimillionaire itself, were it not for the water. So these are the, the foundations of the idealist theory. You must distinguish between philosophical idealism and ethical idealism. They're two totally unrelated ideas. <clears throat> philosophical idealism means that only the, the ideal world is the real world, that is to say, the world in the mind. <clears throat> is incredibly plausible. As it has been stated by people like Berkeley and Bradley and Western idealists. But today it is about the most unfashionable philosophical theory in the academic world that you could follow. Because Western philosophy has undergone a great revolution since about 1914. In that year, uh, there was published the Wittgenstein Tractatus. And Wittgenstein came from the so-called Vienna School, or was influenced by the Vienna School, of uh, people who call themselves scientific empiricists, sometimes logical analysts, sometimes logical positivists. <coughs> and they said, only statements that are visible empirically verifiable have meaning. And they never verified that statement. But that was their point of departure. That's their basic assumption. Everybody has a metaphysical assumption which you can't prove. Watch out for it. Basic to all thought. For example, you must be consistent. Try it. But at any rate, this school has had immense influence in the 20th century. And it argues, basically, that in order to say something meaningful, he's having fun. Uh, you must be able to verify, that is to say, to verify things by prophecy. If you make a prediction based on your statement and it comes up true, you verify it. If it doesn't come true, you haven't verified it. You've de-verified it. The statement, a statement which was de-verified, shown to be untrue, might be meaningful, but untrue. But a statement that you can't think any way of verifying it 
is in this theory meaningless. Now, so you say, the world is ruled by God. Everything that happens, happens under the governance of God. So the logical analyst says, you've made a statement now that says everything is affected by X, God. Suggest a way of verifying this. What difference would it make if it weren't so? Would it make any difference? to the way things are going on if they weren't governed by God. This is the problem because it's just the same as if you had said all bodies whatsoever in the universe that includes all stars, all galaxies, all planets are moving in a certain direction. Now there's no way of verifying this because you can only verify movement in a certain direction by comparison with something that's relatively still. But there will not be any still body with reference to which all the other bodies move because you said in the beginning all bodies in the universe are moving in such and such a direction. So you could only say everything in the universe is governed by God if you made an exception. Uh, but there are certain things that are not, you see. Then, according to logical analysis, you could have made a meaningful statement. But when you start making statements about everything, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't prove it, you can't disprove it. And so they say, although you, you, you think you have said something, you haven't really said anything at all. You made a statement that is actually as nonsensical as asking why is a mouse when it's been. But this statement about God doing or ruling all things sounded meaningful because we're used to it. <clears throat> but it's really pure nonsense. This has been so persuasive in the climate of academic philosophy today that uh, idealism of all kinds is, as I said, extremely unfashionable. But there are considerations that might cause us to reflect on this more carefully. Because we can think of situations analogous to the idea that all things are ruled by God, or all things exist only in the mind. There are situations analogous to that in our everyday experience. Only we can be aware of these situations because we stand outside them. Consider a mirror. A mirror will reflect all kinds of shapes and colors. And when you look at the mirror, the mirror